Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible studies. This is Wednesday, October the 26th, and we are studying tonight uh, from the book of Exodus. So I want to welcome each and every one of you. And I, before I begin, I would like to say thanks to my beloved pastor, our senior pastor, Michael Bacchus, our assistant pastor, Jesse Prasad, our ministerial staff, as well as the leaders of Full Gospel and the entire membership, and also all our friends. So thanks for joining us tonight in our Bible studies. And so before I, I continue, I would like to just begin with a word of prayer and giving God thanks for this privilege and opportunity to share. So thanks again, Pastor Bacchus, for entrusting me. God bless you. Father, right now, we just thank you for this privilege, this honor, that it is to come in your presence, to share your word, to study your word, and ask of you, O oh God, tonight that you will open up my understanding, give me knowledge, God, give me wisdom, disclose, O oh God, reveal the things, give me a rim of word for your people, for myself to receive it. So, Father, that we will study your word to show ourselves approved. The word of God said, the workman, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, Father, for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Without any further ado, I'm going to share a song that's in keeping with our theme tonight. Our song is from the, the, the scripture is taken from Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And our pastor so wisely gave us the scripture, the theme, what's in, the, in thine hands. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. So I would trust the Lord. You'll enjoy the song. You're familiar with it. It's not a, you're not a stranger to this song. So we're going to now begin to share this song for you. So I uh, just bear with me because I'm handling the technology. So God is good. Amen. Here we go. We're going to bless you tonight. With this beautiful song, Marvin Slaughter. Said when you have a work to do, and the task ahead seems bigger than you, that's when he steps in. When you know in your heart that God's command takes more than can be done by man, that's when He steps in. He sees you at the point of your Of where you are, that's when he steps in. Oh, yes, a little boy's lunch of fish and bread is all you have for the need ahead. That's when he steps in. Let him take it. In the moment you live, and in the moment. 
a promise. He promised to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. And that is a promise that the Lord will keep because he's a promise keeper. And I will jump right into our text as we read tonight. I'm reading from Exodus, as I said before, from chapter four, verses one through seven. And I'm reading from the Living Bible. And it says, but Moses, they, but Moses said, they won't believe me. They won't do what I tell them to do. They'll say, Jehovah never appeared to you. What do you have in your hand? The Lord asked him, and he replied, a shepherd's rod. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So he threw it down, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. Then the Lord told him, grab it by the tail. He did, and it became a rod in his hand again. <laughs> Do that, and they would believe you, the Lord told him. Then they will realize that Jehovah, the God of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has really appeared to you. Now reach your hand inside your robe next to your chest. And when he did and took it out again, it was white with leprosy. Now put it in again, Jehovah said. And when he did, he took it out again. And it was normal, just as before. I am going to read, and it's Exodus 4, 2, verse 2 tells us, And the Lord said to him, What is that in thy hand? The answer to God's question was that Moses had a shepherd's rod in his hand. Throughout the Bible, God had a habit of using whatever a person possessed. If that person was simply yield to God. Amen. So I am going to talk today a little bit about our circumstances. God using our circumstances. So God will use our circumstances to do his will. Because our circumstances are tied into our destiny. At every point in, our, in every person's life, everybody's life, there is a manifestation of his destiny that he or she can use to get to that place, to that destination. Something will catapult us. Something will be a, cat a catalyst that will cause us. That will be that thing that will propel us into our destiny. So it would take us to what we're going to be. It is going to bring out, take us everything that we have, whatever we have at that moment. And that's what God is going to use for us to become who we are now or in the future. Because 
By his power, the word of God says in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, By his power, he has given us everything necessary for life and righteousness. Amen? So that means that's everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes And the indifferent. Sometimes we hide our our situations, our sins, we are concerned with what others will say because we are afraid. But God, when we're transparent, when we're open, God can use those things that we are hiding. So he's saying in, in, in that he has already, it, everything is for life is necessary because he has given it to us. Amen. And a lot of things that happen to us. And I have many stories, but I will not get into my stories. But I want to say a lot of things that happen to us, we question God and we wonder why me, why did it happen? Sometimes we go down that path, knowing that the enemy is also at work to destroy God's people because we know what his word says, that he comes to kill and to destroy, especially if we're walking with the Lord. But sometimes God allows some things like we know in the stories of the book of Job, he allows that the enemy will, you know, because he knows, he says, Job, it's my righteous servant. You can test him. And so many times our testings and our trials, the Lord allows them for greater good to take us into that destiny. And in Exodus chapter two, we learned of Moses' circumstances that brought him into his destiny. He was born a place of poverty, in a place, from a place of poverty, to be raised in a place of wealth. Amen? So baby Moses, just a little bit, a little recap, because of, of we heard the story, those of us that are watching, but those of us that don't know it, just a little recap for you. Moses was born in, in a time where the Pharaoh in Egypt, that time, he was seeking to kill all the male babies. Moses was born to a Hebrew woman, a mother. His mother, while they were in Egypt, they were enslaved. The Egypt, the Hebrews, the Hebrews, Israelites were enslaved. So she was into slavery, but she was a midwife. Her name was Jacobed, Jacobed. So her, the job of the midwife, she was one, but their job was to destroy their babies as they're delivering these babies and then they come out male babies. One of the jobs that they asked them to do, one of the, it wasn't a nice thing to do, but that's what they're asked. Midwives to destroy those male babies as they delivered them. But Jacobin, as she delivered her baby, she saw that he was, the Bible says, God, goodly. He was good looking. He was, he was a healthy baby. Let's put it that way. So she put baby Moses in a basket. And let's read from Exodus chapter two, verse three says, then when she could no longer hide him, she hid, she hid him for three weeks. When she could no longer hide him, she made a little boat from papyrus reeds that, uh, that grew the reeds that grow and she waterproofed it with a tar put the baby in it and laid him among the reeds along the river's edge now these were moses circumstances but the story doesn't end there let's read chapter 2 verse 4 and i found this to be funny because it says and i thought that was a perfect setup how god does things it's set up it says and his sister Miriam, the Moses' sister, she was a little older, but she's still a little girl. And his sister stood afar to witness what will be done to him. So she was watching. Was it sent? Was she sent? Or she was just got appointed because there was purpose in that. So when we read down in verse seven, that same chapter two, then said his sister to the Pharaoh's daughter, because the story goes that the Pharaoh's daughter came along the river and saw this, this basket floating and she rescued the baby. So this little girl came out from where she was in hiding. And when she saw the Pharaoh's daughter, she said, the Pharaoh's daughter, she said to her, shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse this child for thee? So this was a common practice in those days that the mothers, the women, they call them wet nurses. Leave, I don't know if today, but they did. And there is a common practice in those times that women from ancient times will, sometimes they will be employed to breastfeed newborns. 
to provide the milk and breastfeed them and raise them up to a certain age. So this proposition it provided an easy way for the Pharaoh's daughter. She's like, oh yes, yeah, she said. And then she trusted the little girl because she would not maybe have trusted a grown person, but she was a little girl who asked. So she trusted the little girl. And she said, and so I believe that's God intervening again. Whatever you have in your hands, God will intervene. So this is unknown to the Pharaoh's daughter. The nurse would also be Moses' mother. The result would be the rescue of Moses, his mother nursing him at the young age, an adoption for Moses into the wealthiest family in the nation, in Egypt. So the princess, which is the Pharaoh's daughter, she winds up paying Moses' own mother to care for him. The, and during the most crucial times of a child raising a baby, in that time, they need the nurturing of their mother. They need the breast milk. And so in those days, the customs in, in the Jewish culture was to feed their babies two to three years, up to two to three years old. So she had that privilege. Now, did the princess know that little girl was Moses' sister, Miriam? Did the princess know the Hebrew woman was his biological mother? But God perfectly us orchestrated he planned it. He orchestrated every event to uniquely prepare Moses for this future role. So here, I'm fast forwarding because now Moses is gone. He was raised in the Egyptian culture. He was raised amongst the Israelites, his own people. But as the prince of Egypt, they called him. But now he gets in some situations that we, can, that we have read and he commits a crime and he runs, he escapes and he's gone. So fast forwarding, when God spoke to Moses, this question and this question, what's in thy hands? That's where it appears the first time in the Bible. But this question appeared in, in different, different forms in other parts of the Bible. And we'll go down to that, those examples. But this question for the first one in chapter four, verse two. When, where God called Moses and told him to go to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Moses, however, was afraid that they won't believe him. And he asked for a sign of the power of God. And God asked him this question. What's in your hand? To Moses, it was just a staff used to beat the stubborn sheep. But to God, it was the instrument by which miracles will be performed. Amen? Again, to Moses, it was just a rod, just a stick. But to God, it was an instrument for miracles. We are instruments in God's hands for miracles. Believe that and remember that. Because we read so down and below, it says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, it says, So Moses, now he obeyed, took his wife Zipporah and his sons Gershom, and Eliezer, and seated them on a donkey. But this is the part, and he says, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took, this is the scripture, the part of the verse, Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. He took it. And it was used, because this staff, as we know, we, we read the, the stories of what happened in Egypt. This rod, he used it to part the Red Sea, he performed, there was 10 plagues God sent through this rod and bringing water out of the rock, etc. So there's a lot of things that that rod carried through over the, the time of them leaving the Exodus. He carried that rod. You'll see sometimes a picture of, of an old man with a white beard that they portray him as Moses standing up on the top of the mount where he never came and he was standing with a, with, a, with a rod, with the stick, amen? So this is, now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the hand, not going to focus too much on the hand, but um, the hand, the word hand in Hebrew means, it's, it's, it's in the Hebrew word is yad, Y-A-D. I love to go to the, to the uh, old, the, the, uh, these books, the concordance and the, all these different books just to find out and I do have a Hebrew Bible with me it's right here but I can't go into it 
But it's, I got into the strong, the strong um, concordance book, and it says yad, Y-A-D, means hand. And it sounds like yard, little yard. It sounds Y-A-W-D, yard. So we use our hands, this is what it is, on everything. They are the most useful tools on our body. That's the explanation, there are tools. So it's a translation of yard tools in, in the Hebrew word. But what does hand represent spiritually? The hand is the most frequently symbolized part of the human body. It gives blessings. It's expressive. Like I talk a lot with my hands, if you all notice, I know sometimes I have to hold them back, but it's expressive. And according to the Greek philosopher Aristotle, the hand is is the tools of tools. He go beyond a little bit the Hebrew translate Hebrew word, and he says the tools of tools. That's the Greek. In general, it is strength, it's power and protection. However, it can just as easily be mean generosity, hospitality, and stability. We know the expression "lend a hand," "lend a hand" to a brother or sister. Amen. So therefore, the hand, they're instruments in God's, in God's kingdom. I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 4 again over verses 5. I'm just going to recap that. What I understood is that Moses was aware of his own weaknesses. He expressed fear about the Lord calling him to lead his people out of bondage. So God simply asked Moses, what is in, what is that? What is that in your hand? The Lord shifted Moses' attention away from his anxiety. You know, because when I like for me to do this Bible studies, it caused a lot of anxiety. Day, two days, three days preparing. But then God shift my thinking to, I am going to do this. You just make yourself available. So thank you, Lord, for that. And I know that's what God did when he said to Moses, what is that? And Moses said, it's a rod. He says, Ben. So he suggested. So from that took away his attention from his own self. And now he knows. And every concern he had, that, oh, am I going to go back to Egypt? I cannot speak. Excuses. And a lot of times, they're not excuses. They're valid, too. A lot of times, it's real fear that we feel, you know, to do some things that God calls us to do. But God says, trust me. And so with that, in front of him, God says, now, you must notice, what is that? What is that in front of you? In front of you. What is it? And he says, a shepherd rod. So God showed Moses that he could use this ordinary staff, this ordinary rod, to perform miracles as a sign for unbelieving. For the unbeliever. The signs are for the unbeliever. Okay, I know that we use the scripture signs and wonders will follow they that believe, but I believe, and I believe that is the scripture correctly, of course, but also is the unbeliever that need to see, like we know the doubting Thomas, he did not believe that Jesus was pierced, so he had to put his fingers literally into the wounds, but the unbeliever, so they will not, because Moses was concerned that they would not believe him, but he said that they would believe through these miracles. So as Moses trust in God, his trust grew, so did the magnitude of the miracles of God. And God worked through his servant. Now, I know sometimes we have a tendency to despair. We worry. We get frustrated. We get downcasted. We get depressed over some lost opportunities. But I'm going to say, Sometimes we think about, oh my God, I would have done this or that if I had done this differently. Or, and, and we're living with regrets because we're thinking the future, oh my God, I didn't plan to, oh my God. And then we constantly concern about the future, about what we have gone through and how do we going, how are we going to get through it? And it's a human, it's the part of us that are, you know, we're just human, we're not divine. And so God, knowing this, and God is saying to us, just like he said to Moses, as you're going through these things, worrying about lost opportunities, ask yourself, what is in front of me? 
What do I see in front of me? What is in front of me? In other words, what circumstances and relationships are currently available to you? This question can get your focus off past regrets or a scary future and back to what God is, can do in your life. And that's a similar question that God asked Moses in the burning bush. Moses was a very troubled man. He was troubled. But do you think your past failures are too much for God? <laughs> do you have fearful thoughts about your future? Remember, what's that in your hands? What are your current relationship with God? Can God, can you benefit from just knowing that you remember God did it? Can you benefit from just thinking he will do it for me too? Let go and let God. So God works with what's in our hands. Point number three. Many of times we look outside of ourselves to help to do something for help. And then we doubt God's ability to use, which he had placed already in us. And it takes us a little, and, and, and can he can take a little bit, and he can make something more than enough for us. Just like the song says, whatever you have in your hands is more than enough for God. I'm going to use some examples here, and then about how God did with the little bit, and we have heard it. In, in this past month that we've been studying the scripture, God used in, in, in John chapter six, verses five, uh, chapter six, verses uh, five through 12. So as Jesus was faced with the challenge of feeding the multitude of 5,000 people, they had gathered to hear him speak. They needed food and asked if anyone had any spare. So a little boy, he had, Five loaves of bread and two fishes. That's it. That was not enough to even feed maybe himself. That's it. Or not even not Jesus, not the disciples. So imagine that's five loaves of bread and two fishes. That's all he had. But now God, Jesus prays over it. He multiplies it and he feeds the multitude. What does that say? That is saying that there are times that we can't, I mean, most of the times we cannot see, we open up our kitchen cupboards, we look in, we look out, and, and we have to stop and think, but God has a provision, anything you want, he already provided. We have another example in, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The widow of, the pro the widow of a prophet was in debt and had no means of paying up. She went to Elisha for help. And what did he do? He asked her, what do you have in your house? She replied, nothing, just a little oil. To her, that oil was nothing. But to God, it was what she needed to meet her current need, her expenses. Elijah gave instructions. And the little oil filled barrels and was sold to cover her debts. So we have examples. Now, I have another example. And this one, of course, is John. We have another, the Bible's filled with them. But I picked these, John chapter two, verses one through 11. This is the miracle, the first miracle of Jesus Christ. So this, this is Jesus, his mother, and the disciples. They attend the wedding of Cana in the village of Cana. But when the wine runs out of the feast, the best wine, Jesus turns water into wine. Now, it wasn't, it's some steps to it. Of course, they panic and they, but Mary says, I'm going to go to my, to Jesus, my son. And he did not want to, but he said, I'm not quite yet prepared to go and perform these miracles, but he did it. But here's the thing. He, at this point, he took this was an opportunity of converting water into wine. And it was the best wine. The, the bride's father, the, they, he was rejoicing that he had the best wine to serve. But at this point, Jesus was revealing his divinity. He was demonstrating to those around him that he was divine. 
And it also shows God's power to create something out of nothing. Now, Jesus wants us to believe him. And he wants us to trust him. And is asking for, he says, ask me for my, your help. If you need help, ask me. Especially when you have unexpected problems. He can turn them into things that we would never imagine. Now, Jesus is asking us, have this confidence approaching. The source of our confidence is our relationship with him, with Jesus Christ. He's interceding, says in Hebrews 7.25, he's saying he's forever interceding, making intercession for us. And he's also our advocate. He's also always defending us from the enemy. That's in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And also he says, approach, come, approach my grace, my throne of grace, come with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is inviting us. He's saying, coming, and come. This is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 17, 4, 16, I apologize. Now, how, a question, how do we turn what we have now into what we need it to be according to the will of God? We simply need to find what God's word says about that thing, that situation, confess the word with our mouth over and over again. And by that, we are injecting God's purpose. We are putting the life of Christ in. We are putting his word into the situation. So let's speak the word over it. Speak the word over it. Believe it. Insist. So instead of complaining about those things, we speak the word of God into them. Amen? Because all the circumstances that come, they come to make us greater and stronger. All you need to do is not despise what you have now. Instead, be grateful for it. Nurture it with all your heart. And speak the word of God into it and watch God use it to increase you. I have the scripture in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. It says, do not despise those small beginnings. We have desires, aspirations, dreams, etc. And sometimes it causes us to despise what we're, where we currently are. Sometimes we, oh, I should be here. I should have a mess. I should have a this. I should have this. I should have a family. I should have children. I should already, should have, should have. But God has us where he wants us to be. So let's just not despise those humble beginnings. So again, nothing happens by chance. You're not in that current situation by chance. It's all part of a plan. And supposed to work together. It's supposed to work together for the good. But that can only happen if you stop complaining, despising about what you have. And start seeing what God wants us. What he's going to do through you and through that situation. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God, not from us. And we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, but God choose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So brethren, friends, as we go into a new week, don't despise your days of little beginnings. Stop complaining and making excuses. Have a grateful attitude. Get the word of God in your mouth and in your heart. And watch how God uses that little bit to create a lot, a lot. So what is in your hand? God bless you and have a fruitful week. Amen. God bless you. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake together and running over. So you know what time it is? It's time for you to give. And in order to do that, all you need to do is go to our church's website. Go to www 
fganny.org. That's www.fganny.org. And when you get to the webpage, all you have to do is click give and it will open up where you'd be able to pay your tithe, your offering, or give to any special ministry that you would normally give to. So don't forget, go to www.fganny.org and give.